first of all, uh, thank you very much no, for inviting me here. It's wonderful to be here and uh, all teachers, no, fellow educators. First, let me uh, thank uh, the Korea Foundation, the Korean Studies Program, and the uh, Gokongwe Brothers School of Education and Learning Design of the Ateneo de Manila University, no, my former institution. So uh, it's wonderful to, to, to be back and to, to be doing this uh, presentation with you this afternoon. So uh, thank you very much also for the very generous uh, introduction. So uh, maybe a few thoughts no? uh, before I start sharing. Um, the topic that has been assigned to me is democracy, uh, regional democratization movement in South Korea and the Philippines. So um, some of the things that uh, I'm going to discuss with you this afternoon, I have to confess, no? it has been a bit difficult for me to do a, the preparation for this uh, discussion. Uh, First of all is uh, because uh, I'm not exactly an, a historian. No? I did not really focus uh, mainly on Korean studies. But um, I was happy to accept the invitation of my uh, language teacher, no? Ms. Xavier, because um, part of the things that I would like to talk about and I wanted to have the chance to discuss some of the things that um, made me interested no? to go to Korea to pursue graduate studies uh, around a decade ago. So uh, some of the things I'm going to share with you this afternoon are the things that I learned no, when I, I was there, the things that I have read, the things that I have discussed with uh, many Korean colleagues. But as a Filipino uh, scholar, uh, my starting point is uh, coming from the Philippines. No? And the nice thing that I saw um, more than a decade ago when I went to Korea is that there are so many uh, parallelisms. There are so many parallels between South Korea and the Philippines, and that actually, you no, know, my gateway to to understanding the history and politics and development of South Korea started from my experience and my own familiarity with our history. So I'm going now to share my screen, and um, let me, ano lang, no, share a few notes before I formally uh, discuss the lecture. Now, um. I don't know if you can see that. I hope you can. <laughs> so that's the title of the presentation, Democracy and Development in South Korea and the Philippines. So just a few notes uh, this afternoon before I, or I start. No, um, One of the challenges of this topic is, is really politics. No, is uh, The presentation this afternoon will touch on sensitive political topics. No, There's uh, a lot of history and a lot of politics that um, are... I know, no? um, political considerations in both countries, both South Korea and the Philippines. And uh, I find that uh, in discussing these things, these things are typically loaded. Some of them can be a bit emotional. Some of them touches on our own uh, politics and convictions. So uh, this uh, afternoon, uh, I will uh, share my own insights and thoughts and the things that I know about uh, the topic assigned to me. But you may find yourself disagreeing with some points, no? Maybe you disagree with some some of the things that I'll mention, or maybe some of my take. It is okay, no? It's okay to to have a disagreement or to have a different take. So um, we respect different political beliefs, but in this forum, empirical, documented, scholarly evidence, I believe, is greater than beliefs and anecdotes. We have different experiences about martial law, no? Those of you who those of us from Korea might have different experience, no? Uh, but um, uh, for this, the purpose of this presentation, we try to have an objective take. And many of the points will be based on verifiable, empirical, documented, and scholarly sources. So um, as uh, one of my former colleagues said, no, it's okay to, uh, no, no? we're all entitled to our opinions, but we're not entitled to our own facts. So some of the things, no, uh, we'll look at facts and then I, I let you have your own interpretation. Uh, some of the facts maybe you, you know better than me probably no especially if you're a fan of the korean historical dramas that uh, not the old historical ones but the more recent ones no? there's a lot of of uh, dramas that feature some of the more contemporary no relatively recent experiences of south korea no um and then the other thing is let this be a conversation and sharing rather than a lecture. I don't have a lecture. This is not my primary area of expertise, but this is something that I really am very interested in. Uh, if you have some thoughts, uh, uh, you want to make some corrections, feel free to type it in the chat box. You have some questions and then we'll try to take 
uh, as soon as we have the opportunity to try to to address no um okay so let that be ano no um uh, some of the rules so i will start this discussion by sharing the key takeaways no? i start with the key takeaway so you know what's the point no <laughs> even if you forget everything else at least you know the point that i'm trying to get across okay so uh first is south korea and the philippines are like mirror images of each other in some ways no and that's actually what's what drew me to south korea they share many parallels both in their economic and political history especially the most recent one post 1950s so many parallels no the second uh, key takeaway i'd like to point out and this is a major point for this discussion is that the political and economic trajectories the development no economic development and political trajectories of the two countries were laid down during a critical juncture between the 1960s and the 1970s no so uh, as you are aware no the the fate of the two countries have diverged but we shared a very common very similar history but much of this divergence in terms of our political and economic fortunes uh, were laid down i would argue between the 1960s and the 1970s both countries experienced authoritarian regimes under leaders who also shared many similarities and also in some ways adopted similar policies no uh, uh, different execution wise but there are some similarities uh, next is both countries regained their democracy in the 1980s mid 1980s mid late 1980s at around the same time but the the diverging development paths were already had, had already had momentum no okay ba na they diverged in the 70s and this divergence we can feel until today and i would say that a mix of decisions actions internal and external circumstances lead to the different development outcomes for south korea and the philippines in some way our politics are still quite similar but the development outcomes are a bit different and when somebody asks me uh, why is that uh, there's no simple answer it's complicated okay but um, uh, there are things that we can uh, look at no that might give us some answer or explanations so first is just to look at democracy in South Korea. Uh, I'm talking in the context of uh, post World War II, and uh, we know that uh, Korea was divided into nor uh, uh, North and South Korea after World War II. No, this was the height of competition between the United States of America and its allies, no, the Democratic allies and the allies of the uh, uh, USSR. No. It's a Soviet uh, ally. So uh, you had the communist bloc and, and the democratic bloc at that time. So um, uh, Singh Panri was elected president even um, after uh, World War II, I think around 1948. No? And uh, he, he became president. He became a wartime president when North Korea decided to invade South Korea in an attempt to unify the, the peninsula. Uh, beginning in 1951 and lasting until the 1953. So uh, some uh, observers note that uh, Singh Man Ri did not sign the armistice actually that paved the way for war, but, uh, the, the, the peace between uh, uh, North and South Korea because he favored continuation of the war. In a way, Singh Man Ri did not have a very positive view of communism no is he he want he would have uh, some observers argue that he might have preferred to unite the, the the peninsula no rather than have that tentative division in the 38th parallel um he remained president afterwards uh, even after the korean war uh, with the support initially of the united states uh, however his term was not exactly democratic and many uh, scholars note that uh, his term was marred by political repression. No? He's particularly harsh towards perceived opposition, especially those who are perceived to be sympath sympathetic or sympathizers or supporters of uh, North Korea. So um, there were some attempts on his life, uh, I believe, no, and I think that just kind of galvanized his his, uh, his strong opinions against communism and uh, North Korea. Uh, political repression, the uh, dissatisfaction, and uh, the the waning uh, economic situation uh, in in the 1960s led to uh, a group led by General Park Chung Hee and his uh, group. No, he's an army general to uh, do, uh, launch a coup d'état and depose um, uh, President Singh Man. 
So I will just want to show you what what the Philippines and the South Korea look like after the wars, no? Uh, the photo on the left is Seoul after the Korean War 1953 and Manila after World War II in 1945. So as you can see, the two countries were similarly devastated, no? Uh, very much devastated because of, of the the toll of war. So recovery was a challenging process, independent heavily on external support especially the support of the United States. And in this way, both countries remained economically and politically dependent as well as militarily dependent on the U.S. for the next succeeding decades. Okay, What was the state of development like? No? So of course, these are post-war uh, uh, countries. In a way, no? um, uh, in the 1960s, both countries had relatively low levels of development. Economies were primarily agricultural. No, uh, they are based on raw materials and commodities like agricultural products, sugar, uh, no, sugar for the Philippines and, and, and the coconut oil, copra. No, and then uh, the industries, if they had them, were, were light industry uh, based. Incomes were relatively low income uh, and standards of living uh, were relatively low uh, relative, of course, to many developed countries at the time and the relatively high levels of poverty. I would like to note that in some ways, the Philippines had more favorable conditions than South Korea because it did not go through a very painful process of division and, you know, war between and among Koreans. And uh, Manila had industries had very strong and is one of the relatively, uh, no, no, uh, yeah, good, well industri uh, industrializing uh, countries uh, before World War II. The Philippines also had plenty of natural resources. No, in South Korea, the, this was more challenging, no, because they had uh, they were divided. They had limited uh, natural resources, no, and some of the earlier industries, uh, I believe, of South Korea might have been in the northern part, no. So very challenging. Um, democracy in the Philippines, however, was uh, vibrant uh, until 1972. No, um, I would have to say that ito, no, I was listing all of the presidents. So two of the presidents here became president, uh, be, be, were former vice presidents who assumed or who succeeded as president because the presidents died. No, that was uh, uh, Manuel Rojas was elected in 1946 and then uh, he, he died. So uh, his vice president succeeded him. And then uh, Ramon Magsaysay became president in 1955 and succeeded uh, afterwards because he, he died in an uh, air a plane accident. So in a way, you know, democracy in the Philippines was relatively um, stable with regular elections, peaceful transfer of power. Uh, there were some healthy competition or com if vibrant competition, if not healthy, between political parties. Uh, I'd also like to note that there were some unrest and communist influence, especially in rural agricultural areas. But uh, rebellions of the time was largely quelled by uh, President Magsaysay, the Hukbalahap Rebellion in the old uh, Communist Party, Partido Comunista ng Philippines. There were also some brewing tensions in Mindanao between more and Christian settlers, but this did not yet break out into uh, uh, parang a more unstable situation. Uh, I'd like to note, though, that uh, yes, it's democratic, but uh, oligarchs, rich landowners, and a few families controlled Philippine politics and economy no? then, even as they do now. But for the most part, uh, uh, Philippine society remained relatively stable. There were some things that were happening, some developments and um, some, some, some uh, things that happened that led to the first quarter storm in uh, 1970. Okay, and that is notable. I'd also like to share with you something. No, uh, this is the point that uh, the Philippines enjoyed certain advantages over South Korea during that time. This is Jiangchong Stadium. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. I believe this is the first uh, stadium, indoor stadium in South Korea, uh, established in 1961, built in 1961, no, by a Korean architect designed, but this was actually uh, constructed by a Philippine engineering firm. The reason for that is because Korea's level of development and expertise were not yet that high at that time. So the Philippines had relatively some, some, some advantages. So uh, at the time, uh, there were also some, some uh, Korean uh, uh, doctors, for example, and scholars that studied, say, uh, in the International Rice Research Institute. No? It was not exactly uncommon. So 
just a point the the Philippines had relatively uh, initially some some slightly favorable conditions in South Korea and especially because in the Philippines war ended in 1945 but in South Korea war ended in 1952 okay? now I go now to the tale of two leaders and I I think you will see <laughs> I don't know and this is one of the first photos that I got exposed to when when I was uh, reading about these two leaders, I don't know. No, if you nakikita nyo ba yun, nakikita ko, no? Do you see what I see? No. So in some ways, no, it's not just our history that are like mirror images of each other. No, uh, the two leaders also shared. Some of my students said, you know, they they look like each other in some ways. No, even the hairstyle and the look, kind of uh, similar. No, so. A uh, tale of two leaders, and both leaders, uh, one is Ferdinand Marcos Sr., the other one was Park Chung-hee, were born both in 1917. They became politicians, they became leaders under colonial rule. Uh, um, I think uh, General Park Chung-hee was uh, more militarily oriented, and uh, President Ferdinand Marcos came from a minor political family in the North. They both became national leader in early or mid-1960s. They were both uh, elected president of uh, their respective countries. This is the thing. They both declared martial law in 1972. <laughs> okay, so you see, the parallels. they adopted a lot of uh, policies that were quite similar no, um, to each other. Uh, one of my former teachers said it's like, uh, one of my former colleagues said it's like parang they're copying each other in some way. No? Of course, there were some certain approaches that were, uh, they, and they knew, they knew each other, right? And uh, until today, they both remain popular, but at the same time also divisive in their respective uh, countries. So both of them, bucket, why, why is their emphasis? Why am I mentioning these two leaders in particular? Because I would argue that these uh, leaders, uh, they both became leaders during a crit critical juncture in their nation's history. They did not serve a short term. They were leaders for a long time. And their policies, their actions and decisions would set their countries on political and economic trajectories that persisted long after their terms ended, no, and even after they passed on. Uh, in in uh, public policy, the concept of path dependence argues that events during critical junctures, critical events, in these critical junctures can lead you know, countries, organizations on a trajectory that will continue no, uh, no, meron siyang, uh, we call uh, uh, institute um, uh, inertia or momentum that will continue on until major circumstances force a change in, the, in direction. In other words, these two leaders set their countries in their respective directions. No? So um, maybe just a very important context in that uh, foreign policy in the 1960s to the 1970s that both countries were strongly allied and depended uh, politically, economically, and militarily uh, on, on the United States of America. So these are photos no, of both of them uh, meeting President Lyndon Johnson of the United States. So uh, they also sent troops in, in Vietnam uh, um, as, as part of uh, their support to the United States. So much of the political developments in the 1950s until the 1980s were done under the shadow of the Cold War between the U.S. and its allies in the USSR, no, and the USSR and its allies. The specter of the looming communist threats shaped much of the foreign policy of the U.S., and it also shaped the politics of the countries under their influence here. That includes South Korea and, and the Philippines. No? From Latin America to Asia, the United States favored and supported the rule of strong men, no? So the, the term strongmen, some others, some critics would say authoritarians and dictators. And the support to them was seen as a counter to the communist threat of the Soviet Union and its communist allies. Under, uh, the, under these authoritarian regimes, these leaders ruled without democratic checks and balances. No? So they basically, not exactly very democratic, but justified uh, supposedly to 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 uh, ensure that uh, the communist uh, threats will be addressed no however as a consequence uh, there's a very strong emphasis on military and police uh, states no military police approaches corruption proliferated uh, 
and human rights uh, violations were documented in each and every country with authoritarian regimes. The Philippines and South Korea were just some of these countries, but this were not partic were not exactly unique. But we do share this this difference, no? Because of the U.S. toleration of political and economic support for for uh, these leaders, no, they were able to to overcome a lot of the challenges to their regime. So uh, both countries and both leaders started as uh, uh, democratically elected leaders. Although Park Chung Hee became a leader because of a coup d'état, but still he was elected in an open uh, in an election. So uh, uh, Park Chung Hee was elected president in 1963, and Marcos was elected in 1965. So uh, um, Park Chung Hee had some early successes because uh, uh, the previous president was not very very popular and adopted some very repressive uh, uh, policies. No. Um, uh, Park Chung Hee had the uh, vision of um, um, economic development, uh, and he, 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 however, used uh, much of the power of emergency laws that were established way back in 1948. No, so there were some early successes under the term of Park Chung Hee in the 1960s. However, in the 19 uh, late 1960s, there were already some 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 problems. No, uh, economic. Um, um, Economic uh, growth was uh, slowing. Uh, there were some social unrest, no um, uh, perceived threats uh, from uh, North Korea. No, and um, uh, President Park Chung Hee uh, dissolved the National Assembly and prohibited political activities of political parties in 1972. Ito na yung martial law. Okay, declared martial law in 1972. However, martial law in South Korea did not last that long. Uh, it was ended in 19, also in December of the same year, but there were other series of martial laws that were declared afterwards. However, even not not uh, even when there was no martial law, there were some political repression and authoritarianism which continued. No, um, Park Chung Hee's term ended when he was assassinated in 1979. In the Philippines, uh, similar, uh, but. Uh, Many uh, assessment of Ferdinand Marcos' first term were relatively positive. I put an asterisk there, no. But uh, he win easily won a second term in 1969. Although there were some allegations of cheating, uh, uh, vote buying, and uh, I don't know, uh, there were some uh, social unrest owing to um, some economic slowdown. Um, there were also some. It's a wave of, of unrest, no. In the 1970s, that uh, led into the what is known as first quarter storm, led by many student activists and leaders, some unions and peasant leaders. No, um, in the Philippines, uh, they were also watching uh, for uh, communists. No, the old communist party ended, but there was a new communist party. The old communist party was Partido Comunista ng uh, Pilipinas, but there was a new CPP that was established in 1969. And it was starting to form its what it's called uh, New People's Army. So um, some of these protests was followed by the Diliman Commune in the University of the Philippines. But some of the major events is uh, the Plaza Miranda bombing in 1971. So um, uh, quite controversial, no? this uh, incident. And uh, this led, or this at least, the, they justified the suspension of habeas corpus in 1971 because of Plaza Miranda bombing and the, the looming communist threat. In uh, September 23, 1972, martial law was declared. Technically, the, I think it was signed in September 21, and it continued on until 1981. So Marcos was president of the Philippines from 1965 until he left in 1986. So uh, just to show you some pictures of what it looks like, this is 1970s picture of Seoul, uh, Apgujong. There were already some developments, construction. But, you know, Ap Apgujong is a very trendy uh, neighborhood today. No? I've been there a few times. Um, but uh, this uh, other picture is Manila in the uh, 1970s. So let's go to the economic uh, development front. Um, Park Chung Hee uh, launched a series of, uh, and Marcos both launched a series of uh, five year development plans, but Park Chung Hee started in 1962. Marcos, I think, was 1970, the first one. 
Partungi had the clear vision of an export-oriented industrialization policy. And these uh, five-year development plans were primarily ano, no, uh, geared towards this. So uh, he, he tried to develop no, transition South Korea from agricultural to light to heavy industries. It includes all of the things that it needs to develop, like chemical industries, heavy industries, which are the foundation of an industrial uh, export-oriented uh, economy. So Park Chung he had some major infrastructure projects, no, uh, um, like the road from uh, to Busan, no, that very very long highway. Um, uh, Marcos, on the other hand, was uh, running a country that had largely an commodity-based economy, some light industries, certain manufacturing, but um, um, certain conditions uh, like the preferential trade agreement between the United States and the Philippines meant that uh, Filipinos, um, uh, landlords, sugar lords were able to sell their sugar and their uh, coconut oil in the US at preferential rates, no? mas mataas, and that did not exactly encourage them to shift from a commodity export-based economy. No? The Philippine economy was largely import-dependent, and um, Marcos wanted to also pursue industrialization, but the, the program was not as clear as uh, South Korea. But uh, Marcos' project of, uh, for the Philippines was larger in scale in terms of infrastructure. No? Marcos went on a spending spree uh, and developed so many roads, infrastructure, uh, facilities, many of the which uh, still stand today, but these were uh, massively debt funded, so largely funded by debt to values institutions. No? So um, both countries were disrupted by the energy crisis in 1973, oil crisis in 1979. So these are just Countries that are still in the early stages of development, but uh, they were disrupted, especially 1973 was quite, uh, no, no. And um, the problem is uh, many of the, the projects of Marcos did not generate the returns that was expected. Uh, they became white elephants, no. Okay, um, uh, like a Bataan nuclear power plant, no. And uh, the Philippines incurred massive debt. Both countries uh, were, were taking loans, but uh, uh, Marcos' loans was more massive in that it ex uh, when he became president in 1965, the Philippines' debt was $600 million. But when he left in 1986, the Philippines was debt-ridden to, to the tune of $26 billion. So in terms of approach, uh, when I was discussing this with some colleagues, no, the description was... Uh, Park Chung-hee also supported industrialization by, of course, it's not the government that will, uh, no, no, it, it creates industrialization policy, but uh, the, the, fan, the industries are, are going to be developed and run by uh, the, co the companies, no, corporations. No? Uh, in Korea, it's the family-based conglomerates, uh, some, the term now is chebols. But uh, the way that some scholars uh, describe um, the approach is that Park Chung he gave performance some kind of monopoly uh, to companies based on their uh, performance. So um, um, the Korean economy at the time, uh, certain sectors were given some kind of monopoly. For example, uh, shipping or certain types of car production are given only to particular companies. No, like um, um, Hyundai, uh, for example, maybe uh, shipping uh, that is um, almost uh, most is a virtual monopoly. Uh, certain uh, companies were given uh, privileges for car production, no uh, electronics. So it's kind of um, the government grants uh, loans, uh, provides uh, sovereign guarantee to the loans that these companies uh, do and be, supports um, uh, industrialization by supporting these companies. However, some of my colleagues uh, mentioned that um, uh, uh, President Park Chung-hee was particular in terms of performance, no? that uh, there were some targets that had to be met because the goal is to have an export-oriented uh, economy. So the, the volume and quality of output should, should lead towards um, uh, exports. No? So uh, South Korea's economy is described by economists to follow a state-led development and import substitution uh, strategy uh, model. That is, they, they protect their own 
um, um, economy from um, those that uh, uh, from from by imposing taxes and tariffs on goods that would enter, uh, and then they will give subsidies and support for the things that they were going to export. It's a protectionist uh, policy that was not yet banned at that time. No, it was still uh, uh, allowed. No. In the case of the Philippines, Marcos style is a bit more uh, selective favor to to what uh, the Filipino critics would term oligarchic or you know scholars would use the term oligarchs. No, however, um, you know uh, many of these families were also granted virtual monopolies over certain uh, industries, uh, telecom, uh, airlines, uh, steel, etc. However, the basis for granting these monopolies is largely on the basis of loyalty not performance no so uh um, in south korea uh, some police said that if some of the assigned companies were given this uh, virtual monopoly on a particular sector did not perform that industry was granted uh, passed on to another company or another family conglomerate in the case of the philippines even if that you know, did not succeed did not make money and actually lost money and incurred debt as a result no as long as um, uh, uh, there was loyalty uh, and support of uh, support no? from the 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 president's family no they they were allowed to keep them no so uh, the result was stagnation and failure of uh, uh, many of these ventures i'm also going to show you uh, one of the responses of the two countries uh, to the energy crisis balance of payment crisis because many of these countries did not have strong uh, foreign currency reserves that will allow them to trade for example very important for both countries they were dependent on importing oil no? and there was an energy crisis in 1973 so they needed dollars foreign currency I'm going to show you a picture of uh, nurses. So uh, they started um, sending people overseas. No, I don't want to use the term exporting people, but they started sending migrant workers overseas in order to um, gain or uh, accumulate uh, foreign currency reserves, which are badly needed by their countries in order to navigate and deal with um, the, the energy crisis to pay uh, their loans, even as they took on some more loans. No. So 1963, these pictures are both in uh, Germany. No? So there were some uh, waves of uh, Filipina and Korean nurses in Germany in the 1960s. So um, showing you uh, 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 Korean laborers and working in construction, mining, and oil, uh, South Korea started sending uh, Korean uh, workers in 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 the Middle East, no, the Arab countries starting 1973, okay, and then that lasted until around I think 1985 uh, or so, 86. Um, Filipino laborers in the Middle East also beginning 1973, uh, early 1970s, uh, construction, uh, oil, okay, starting uh, laborers later on, uh, uh, domestic help, no household help um, but uh, the point i'm trying to make is look okay nurses okay i think you're beginning to, to see the parallels no not just with the hairstyle of the presidents but really no uh, some of this uh, no but um uh Park chung um, according to some scholars, Park chung uh, envisioned himself to be ruling as president for life and in a way that happened. However, his life did not last that long because he was assassinated in 1979. Okay, uh, Park chung was succeeded by Army General Chun Doo Wan, who first installed himself as national leader and ruled by decree. No, I think he was uh, 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 elected later, no? But um, um, Park Chun Doo Wan, uh, relatively, some I just read earlier um, uh, material that said that relatively much milder, a little bit milder, but he still expanded martial law and also military presence. So he also effectively closed universities, banned political activities, and further curtailed the press during his time. Um, again, um, no, the, the continuous you know, from the 1950s, 1960s, political repression of opposition and critics became the norm. Uh, the term is social cleansing. 
And of course, human rights violations were documented at this time. So many things happened, like uh, the Guangzhou um, event, which uh, I will show you in, in a bit. No? Uh, of course, uh, society, uh, I'd like to note that society was divided. Uh, there were those who were very critical and protesting Chunduan's government, just as there were those who protested part Chunhi's government. But there were also those who kind of uh, supported, no? supported actually his administration. But there were some protests from various sectors, uh, including students. In Ferdinand Marcos, um, uh, he was still leader from 1975 to 1972. Um, he was able to extend his presidency by declaring martial law by creating a new constitution. Uh, otherwise, he his second term would have ended and he would not have been able to run for president. So he canceled elections, uh, changed the constitution, uh, closed down Congress, limited civil liberties, clamped down on press freedom and protests, and basically uh, managed or tried to, to limit the, the opposition. So uh, under his rule, uh, this is documented that political repression of opposition and critics became normal, normalized in some way. No, when I say normalized, I'm not saying it's normal, but it kind of happened. And there are so many documented cases of this happening. Human rights violations uh, were documented no? by by every credible source. But again. Society was divided. Um, some would say that martial law in 1972 actually made for a more peaceful and orderly society and that crime actually went down, at least in the first few years. No, But it was not everyone. There were those who were, were um, protesting, uh, uh, no, no, basically the repression, the, the non-democratic uh, regime and the dictatorship at that time. So... Um, both regimes were uh, characterized by uh, how would you saw iron-handed rule, no. And there were some incidences in both countries that kind of illustrate this. Some of you might be familiar. This is uh, the Guangzhou massacre in 1980s, no, um, resulting to to deaths of many many people under the hands of uh, military authorities in 1980. This is in South Korea. In the Philippines, it's so hard to find a picture of this, uh, the Escalante massacre in Negros. In 1985, that also led to, to the deaths of so many farmers, again, at the hands of government authorities, no? government military um, uh, authorities. No? So, um, again, uh, protests mark both regimes. So this is an example of a student protest against a dictatorship in the Philippines. I, I think, I can't remember, it is 1970s, 1980s, 1980s. And uh, the other one is Korean student protests against dictatorship. So uh, when I was studying in South Korea, some of my professors were sharing to me that they were students in, in Seoul at that time. And they would share to me their uh, hide and seek. No? They would do lighting protests and then run, no? run in, in um, try to hide from the authorities in the university. So uh, one of my professors said that um, part of it is they 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 were uh, part of it. They were emboldened to to protest, especially when they saw that in the Philippines, no, uh, the protest succeeded uh, and uh, ended uh, the rule of Ferdinand Marcos in 1986. So they were kind of emboldened that maybe if that successful in the Philippines, we can do that too. So um, uh, both uh, regimes uh, fell in in both countries in the mid-1980s. Uh, but this did not happen immediately. They did just, just give way or fall. No? So uh, Chun Do uh, uh, was unable to extend his term constitutionally. He was unable to amend the constitution to give himself more terms. So he declared Doteo as a, success, uh, a successor in 1987. However, that was not met positively because... Um, uh, Rotewo uh, being assigned by uh, an, an authoritarian regime was not necessarily accepted no? uh, very positively. So um, um, June democracy movement broke out uh, across uh, South Korea. There were some incidences, no? uh, torture and the death of a student leader, uh, first in Seoul National University and then the death of a leader, other students in Yonsei University that caused millions of people to go out in the in the street. 
So there were some uh, um, no no there were some um, political issues and protests, but I'd like to note that the uh, Korean economy was on track, and this was in the 1980s. To appease and kind of pacify people, Ro promised more democratic constitution and elections. So uh, in 1987, he won uh, the first democratic elections. No, after long dictatorship, Ro Tae-ho became president of South Korea. So uh, some of you might be wondering. Uh, so if he was an authoritarian leader, or at least the the successor of an authoritarian leader, how did he become president? How did he win the election if people did not like authoritarianism? So um, there are many possible explanations, but some uh, observers said that uh, one reason that might have contributed to his win is because the opposition uh, leaders, Kim Yong-sam and Kim Dae-jong, both became president later on, who ran against Ro, did not, ran, both ran at the same time. So they split the opposition vote and allowed uh, Ro Teo to 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 win as president no so in the philippines major events led to uh, the assassination of benigno aquino junior there were some protests against president marcos and his regime even before then but uh, the political unrest and protests grew in the philippines after uh, benigno aquino junior's assassination and even abroad in the united states in the filipino migrant community uh, those who were formerly not involved no told me that um, after Benigno Aquino Jr.'s death, no, they also started to join the, the protests. So the Philippines was deep in debt and the economy was in shambles. Um, by the early 1980s, I think was that 1981, uh, the uh, um, Central Bank of the Philippines was empty, emptied basically. And the Philippines was deep in debt and the economy was in shambles now. So the death of Benigno Aquino Jr. led to uh, debtors uh, collecting and the Philippines was in, in deep trouble. Uh, President Marcos approached many countries and leaders to get a loan. Uh, that includes an attempt to secure a loan from uh, ano, no? the, the president of uh, Singapore. No? So um, uh, president of Singapore was the, the, the famous president of uh, Singapore. No? Um, uh, the president of Singapore told him that if I uh, he was borrowing, I think five hundred million dollars. No, the president, of Sing uh, the prime minister of Singapore, said that if I lend you that money, I will never see it again. No, because that was how broke the Philippines was. So in order to access um, um, debt to be allowed to get some loans, uh, one of the conditions was for the Philippines to hold snap elections for Marcos mm -hmm. to allow snap elections. Uh, again, no. So he the uh, elections were held in 1986. However, uh, there were those who claimed that uh, no, no, Marcos won the snap elections, but uh, many of the observers, those who were in the, in the the canvassing uh, counting centers, uh, protested, and uh, um, some military officers launched a coup that uh, and the. Um, uh, um, the church led by Cardinal Sin uh, started calling out people to protest, leading to the Edsa People Power protests. So let me just show you some photos. This is the funeral of Lee Han Yol. I think he was from Yonsei University. And when he died, uh, an estimated more than 1 million, I think 1.6 million or more than 1.6 million uh, Koreans went out to protest and joining his funeral. On the right side is the funeral of Benigno Aquino Jr. after his assassination. And uh, also around 2 million people went out to, to, to protest and to uh, uh, um, um, attend his funeral. So uh, the, the protests that followed, they, they continued and they were nationwide, but of course, uh, largely concentrated in capitals. But there were some nationwide protests. They were movements, no longer just um, uh, protests, the left one is June Democracy Movement in South Korea, started in 1986, and the Edsa People Power Movement in the Philippines also in 1986. You see more parallels for both of us, no? Um, so um, um, there were elections in South Korea, 1987, and in 1987, the Philippines and South Korea both had new presidents. Okay, so uh, uh, Corazon Aquino in the Philippines and Notewo uh, in, in South Korea. 
um, um, very important I'd like to point is there are just uh, a few more slides. Um, South Korea rose in the world stage in 1988, particularly in the Seoul uh, Olympics when the Summer Olympics was held in Seoul and marked the emergence of South Korea in the world stage. So um, when they hosted it, it kind of, you know, the South Korea has arrived and it transitioned from first a migrant sending into a migrant receiving country. You see, they were sending out nurses and uh, construction workers, those who would work in oil fields from 1970s, 1960s, 1970s. But by nine, around 1985, 86, South Korea stopped sending workers overseas, stopped sending migrant workers and started getting migrant workers to work in South Korea. By the 1980s, South Korea's economy has largely transitioned to an export-oriented industrial economy. So the vision of Park Chung-hee has already started to come into fruition and they can afford now to host uh, an Olympics, which is a very, very expensive event to host. No? I'd like to show you this. Uh, this is from the Varieties of Democracy data set to, sh to show you liberal democracy. When we talk about democracy, there are several versions, but uh, liberal democracy is one of the main uh, ways that people understand and define democracy. And I'd like to show you where the countries are at the very beginning. So the Philippines is in blue and South Korea is in red. So uh, the Philippines uh, started, according to the VDEM data, sli slightly more uh, democratic, no? but very similar sila. No? Um, you see the 1972, uh, I, I mark it red, it was uh, the declaration of martial law. So very, somewhat comparable in terms of liberal democracy. Um, um, I marked blue. Uh, the, the one, the vertical line blue is uh, when both countries, uh, the authoritarian leaders and regimes ended. So the period between the red and the blue is 1972 to 1987 is a period of uh, authoritarian regimes. No, So, um, well, I also marked 2015, around 2015, 2016, no? uh, because that also marked uh, some major shifts no? uh, in, in the Philippines uh, by 2016. Liberal democracy started going down after going up for several years. No? What happened in 2016? I think, you know, no, no, uh, under the presidency of Duterte, Rodrigo Duterte, South Korea was a bit different. No, uh, here. So let me show you also the eco economic front. Annual per capita. This is uh, adjusted. No, uh, for um, adjusted for. Um, um, income. Um, so this is the income in South Korea and the Philippines from 1945s onward. So the Philippines started a slightly higher income than South Korea. No, but you will note that uh, the Philippines is in blue, South Korea is in red. By 1972, that that started to change. Gradually, South Korea's income was uh, uh, rapidly increasing. While the Philippines' annual per capita income was um, very, very slow, almost stagnant, no? very, very slow, and very, very modest growth. So current annual per capita income right now in 2019, the Philippines was uh, around $7,550 per year per person. In South Korea, that's around $40,000 uh, uh, per person per year. Just to show you no, the parallels, democracy and economy in both countries, look at the period. No? Uh, both countries uh, had were subjected to authoritarian regimes, but this is also the point that I've been trying to make earlier. Between 1972 and 1987, no, uh, under this, both these authoritarian regimes, the authoritarian leaders, similar policies in a way, but look at the, the, the income of both countries. No? That is where the fates of uh, South Korea and the Philippines diverged. So South Korea started growing and now grows rapidly. And the Philippines stagnated. Look, the, the arrow is trending downwards. It was going up earlier and then went down. By 1983 to 1987, the Philippines was down and it never recovered for a long, long time. No, um, much of it has to do with uh, the heavy debt that incurred at that time. 
I'd also like to show you this uh, incomes compared to our neighbors, more comparable neighbors like Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand, just to give you an idea. So uh, the Philippines here is in green, and then uh, Indonesia in blue, South Korea in purple, Thailand in light blue. So you will notice here that, well, if you're looking for the Philippines as the second most development, developed economy in Asia in the 1950s, it never happened, no? Because even if you look at this graph, the Philippines is already second to Malaysia. So if Malaysia is higher than us, we could not possibly have been the second most <laughs> developed economy in Asia at the time. No? So um, take a look at this and you will see that uh, the Philippines was initially leading among its uh, peers except for Malaysia. No? But by the 1972, the Philippines had been overtaken by uh, uh, first by Indonesia, no, uh, by nineteen, uh, medyo dikit, very similar by nineteen eighties, um, early nineteen eighties, and then by Thailand. So by a uh, nineteen ninety, Indonesia, everybody has overtaken the Philippines in its peers. So uh, much of the what happened to the Philippines, you can trace in that critical period between 1970 to 1986. Okay? Uh, except for Indonesia, which only overtook the Philippines around 1990, 1991. So, uh, postscript, because uh, my presentation is now ended. So, uh, I think we know now, now we uh, Korean global brands, very ubiquitous everywhere. Hallyu is everywhere. BTS is everywhere. Uh, and the uh, famous Korean brands have uh, became global, no? very, very global and recognized everywhere. The Philippines also has some global companies in fairness to it. No? I think there are similar numbers of uh, billionaires in South Korea and the Philippines. But the, the Korean economy is way larger than the Philippine economy. There were some Philippine global brands, but relatively fewer than the Philippine brands. And it's not as ubiquitous. No, um, um, postscript. Our politics and the both countries are still, um, no, no. Um, there's still political unrest, and political divide, and uh, more parallels. No, even after 2000, both countries were still jailing. The both countries were jailing their presidents. No, uh, I think South Korea has uh, has uh, indicted four presidents uh, in the last decade. Jailed two. Uh, Philippines has jailed two presidents also in the last two decades. And there are protests that are protesting against and protesting for. So very, the political divide is still, uh, you know, and uh, observers and scholars, political scientists note that the tenue, both countries, their, their attitude toward democracy is a bit tenuous. Both countries are still characterized by polarization and political uh, division. Another postscript, take a look at this. The children of both presidents no, also became president. So uh, Park Jun he the, the daughter of Park Jun he became president in 2013. And Ferdinand Marcos became president in, nine, in 2022. So um, Korean and Philippine societies are still divided on the legacy of these two leaders. And there's still large amount of support, but also there is also some opposition uh, against the legacies of these leaders, no? which translates, you know, can be seen in people's attitudes and votes. There are also regional and generational aspects. This divides. There's uh, regions in, in, in Korea that strongly support uh, President Park Chung-hee and uh, his daughter. Uh, this is a bailiwick. Uh, and the older people, older generation in the Philippines, there are regions, especially the Solid North and the Leyte A, Regions that uh, still support Marcos and uh, um, uh, his, his his son, and uh, uh, older generations uh, might support uh, uh, Marcos, but younger ones are a bit more divided. So I'll just go to uh, uh, going back to the point, the key takeaways that I presented earlier. I think I'm going to end here. No, I'm probably out of time already. I uh, I think you might have some questions in mind, but. Uh, if we have some time, let's just discuss them. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Come